again. It's so glad you've made it a point to be at church because how many know there's a lot of options out there? And one of the things that makes us different as followers of Christ, we say, hey, you know, that time on Sunday belongs to the Lord, and I'm going to go worship at his house. So I commend you for making it a priority. So today I'm continuing on in the series of the need for the supernatural. I said this a couple weeks ago. Uh, I reserve the right to extend this series as long as I want to extend it. <laughs> and so today I'm extending that courtesy right now. I'm going to do that, uh, that thing. I'm going to extend it another week. But uh, we're going to be reading a passage of Scripture that is very familiar. And I know that when you read it, most of you will already have some preconceived notions. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to kind of hesitate in your, in your assumptions, because I'll be explaining it from a different angle today. So would everybody stand for the reading of the word, if you would? Go into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31, through chapter 13, verse 3, and then there will be some more scriptures after this. But let's begin. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 12. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reason like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. The Holy Spirit, I pray that you would lead and guide our thought processes as we study your word. Because Holy Spirit, you've been sent to continue the work of Jesus, not only in us, but through us. And so I pray that we would see your activity as it relates to our journey in this thing we call life, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 The Lord bless you be seated today. So we've been looking at the, the topic, the need for the supernatural, and I will tell you that today's message, as I get a little further into this, we're going to be bringing into this, this arena this thing called prophecy. The Bible talks a lot about it. And so when you talk about the supernatural, you sometimes have to brush up against that very topic. So I'm giving you a little heads up on where this message is going. We're going to be looking here in 1 Corinthians 13 and then moving on to some other scriptures as well. But for those who are joining with us for the first time, or relatively new to the church, I want to at least brush them up on a couple comments that I've made on every message that I've preached in the series. We see that American Christianity, as it is now, has significantly desupernaturalized the Bible and the faith. There's been a, a radical shift in moving away from that concept and that ideology and that doctrine. And many spiritual leaders have supernaturalized the Bible because by definition they themselves have not experienced the supernatural themselves. They figure that since it didn't happen for them, it can't happen for other people. But here's what I want to say. Most of us in this room will agree with what I'm about to say. Not every prayer that God has, not every prayer that I have said, God has answered. Well, I don't, want to be, I don't want to make the statement then, well, since he hasn't answered every prayer, then there's no longer a need to pray. I mean, come on. So what, so what if God doesn't answer every prayer as I see fit? So if I pray for a supernatural activity in my life and I'm not the recipient of it, that doesn't mean that God no longer does the, recip the, the supernatural. How about the fact that maybe he said no? Not this time, not for you at this point in your journey, but it's to make a doctrine out of the fact that God told me no on one specific incident, and now I'm going to lay that on everybody else as a grave, grave mistake. 
So we recognize this, that de-supernaturaling the Bible has led to a lot of unintended doctrinal changes. It's like the dominoes have started falling. Whatever process that I use to dismantle the supernatural activity of God, I can also use to dismantle a lot of other biblical concepts. And we see our culture doing that now. And now churches are just literally flipping their doctrine on its head and going, going the completely different direction And I'll say this, trying to agree more with culture rather than challenging culture. And we're seeing it. But here's the thing. You start removing the supernatural activity of God, and then suddenly whatever process you've used to do that works on other doctrines that you find uncomfortable. So along with this, we have to recognize in the supernatural, and I will say even abuses, Abuses associated with spiritual gifts is often cited as a reason for dismissing the supernatural as it relates to the Christian faith. I know this because I've, I have friends, still do. They're friends. Listen, how many know we need to learn to be friends with people who may not agree with us? I don't know where we ever got to this culture that once you, I find out you disagree with me on something, I unfriend you. <laughs> where did that ever become a biblical expression of you know, wow, one of my friends has a disagreement, so I'm not going to speak to them anymore because they no longer agree with me 100% on everything. No. So I have friends who, who will say, listen, it's messy. I've had, I've had issues in my churches or my church where I pastor, they'll say. And so we just shut it down. Well, that's like saying, well, your kid went past curfew. Therefore, they can never go outside ever again. Well, okay, you, you, you won the victory today, but you're going to have some unintended consequences in the future of a kid who never goes outdoors. And trust me, you're going to feel it as a parent. Okay? So if we're not careful, we can, we can make these radical shifts in, de- in decisions only because things got difficult and things got messy. So 1 Corinthians is not the love chapter. It's actually the correction chapter. And I'm going to show that to you. Some of you have heard me share a little on this before. But we have to recognize that just because things get difficult is not necessarily always a reason to shut something down. And I'll give you an example of this. So I don't know if you guys do this, but we have this at our house. Every spring, you know, we're like, we're ready to get all the, the, the stale air out of the house. So we'll open the back door. We'll open the front door. We'll open a couple windows. And, you know, we get that fresh breath of air. In the house. How many, you know, do that practice? Yeah, some of you ought to. Anyway, it's just, it's just a great practice. So, but here's the thing. Right out, right out our back door, you go 100 feet, and you're into the, I'm serious, the deep woods of, uh, of, of Virginia. It's not like a phasing project on our property. It's like the jungle starts at 100 feet from our back door, you know. And so the problem is, by opening doors and windows, you're going to get some flies and some pollen. But our need for some fresh wind in the house overrides the fact that we're going to get some flies and get some pollen. Now, when we're done airing out the house, you know what we do? We go around and we start swatting the flies. And my wife will start, you know, sweeping and cleaning, trying to get some things that, you know, that may have come in the house, dust or, or pollen. And it's the same way. When you open your, the windows of your life, the windows of your heart to the wind of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to tell you, you're going to get some flies. And you just swat them. Not literally. <laughs> you know, you just go, no, not here, not now, not that way. Okay? We want the win, but unfortunately, we get some flies and you get some dust, and that's just part of the process. And so many, many leaders will just say, that's it. We're done. You know, we're just going to go sterile services, you know, sterile church. And that has its own issues and its own challenges. So let's look at, let me, let me, let's go through 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as I read it. And we're going to touch on that first uh, part of verse 12. It says, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. Hey, how many would like to know the most excellent way? Yeah. Right. What a great statement. So he starts off in verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Notice he, said, he does not say, as I, as I once spoke, he says, If I speak, he is speaking present tense. So this is still happening. But what I want you to see is this. He is saying that it is possible to do this 
and still be wrong. Do y'all see it? So he's, what he's saying is, you're doing the right thing in the wrong way. Oh, he goes on to say, uh, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am not. Do you see that they do have faith that does move mountains? And he's saying you did the right thing, but you did it the wrong way. Now, I, I, I don't, as a pastor, I read this and I go, well, God, you shouldn't do that. You ought to just shut them down. If their attitude's not right, just take whatever you gave them and take it away from them. Don't let them do that. But God doesn't always take my advice. <laughs> Anybody else that found out that, you know? How many have ever advised God on what he ought to do? Yeah, yeah. We do it. We do it under the guise of prayer. You know, you got power, and I got ideas, let's merge the two. Yeah. So he's saying these people do, they, it, it works. Their giftings are fun. But he's saying the attitude with which they're doing it is not good. It's kind of ironic. The gifts, well, I'm getting ahead. He says, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. So I can be a, a tremendous giver and my attitude's wrong. And so the giving never accomplishes what God intended. It has an impact, but it never accomplishes all that God intended for it to accomplish. And so what we see here is this. It is possible to function in spiritual gifts in the wrong way. Now, like I said, I have, I like, well, God, you shouldn't let that happen. You should, if you see their attitude is wrong, just, 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 and here's the problem. While the spiritual gifts are perfect, the people they flow through are not. God has a problem. You want to hear what his problem is? He only has imperfect people to use. I'm going to tell you a secret. I'm not perfect. I know. Shocking. Even my wife is a shock. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, God sends perfect gifts through imperfect people. And so sometimes the imperfection twists the perfect that's being sent. That's, if you haven't recognized, this is not heaven yet. I know you think it is. It's Virginia. But believe it or not, things can still get better. Okay, so, this, so God sends his perfect gifts through imperfect people. And sometimes the imperfection of a person taints the perfect gift we need to know that so that we go i don't understand why god's letting that person do xyz i just don't understand why god doesn't stop them well god may be working a process but we need to have the judgment to recognize like hey that's that was really a good thing but i don't know there's something off there like the attitude the something's that's okay to have that discernment and that come on the radar that goes something's not right here I know what I saw, but something's off. Okay? I just want you to know there's a biblical basis for that. Now, sometimes you have to wait for God to show you more so that you just don't operate in suspicion all the time. Now, let's go to the rest of these verses. It says, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. This is oftentimes used as the passage to say, see, that's why we don't need the gifts anymore. And I'm like, Context, context, context. And please finish reading the rest of the verses. Look at this. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Here's the problem with prophecy. We don't always know everything. And sometimes in prophecy, people can perceive that we're therefore knowing everything by prophecy. And it's like, no, you don't know everything. And by the way, that should be the one thing that keeps you humble. Okay, dependent upon the Lord, I may be speaking, but not fully aware of what I'm speaking to or about. I'm only sharing enough of what I know, but there's no way that I can know. And by the way, I don't think I really want to know everything that God knows. I probably couldn't go to sleep tonight. So he only reveals pieces to us. Again, that's a struggle. But when completeness comes, 
what is in part disappears. The struggle is that word completeness. Hmm. It's used in a variety of contexts within the Bible on a variety of issues. And so the thinking is this, well, then it means X, Y, Z, and I'm going to touch on this. But if you want to know what this word is applying to, you've got to look at the context. What is completeness? Well, there's more verses to come. Let's let, how about we let the Apostle Paul contextualize this? Ready? So let's go to verse, or verse 12. For now we see only a reflection as in an emir. We, there, then we shall see face to face. There's the key word. Face to face. If it's my face, I need another face which belongs to a person. If I take my notebook, this is not face to face. This is face to notebook. Face to face means it's another person. Okay? If I said, I've put my face to this face, you would say, Pastor Lisa, help your husband. He's got an issue. He thinks his notebook has a personality. No, it's a notebook. I would never say this is a face. Face belongs to a person. So, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall fully, and even as I am fully known. So, the word completeness and face to face are our clues. Let's do a little detective work here. There's only really three options that this text can remotely apply to. Number one, it's the maturity of the church. That when the church is mature, then we no longer need these giftings. Please don't make a case that you think the church is mature today. The church is being perfected. The church needs a lot of work. But there's no way that I'm going to ever say, yeah, we're there. We've arrived. No, I'm saying we're on the journey. We're doing well, but let's keep going. Okay, maturity is ongoing. And the second thing is this. Context. The people of Corinth didn't have access to Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians, and Colossians when they received this. So you can't jump to other books of the Bible because they didn't have other books of the Bible yet. So whatever you come up with has to be in the book of 1 Corinthians. You say, well, it's 2 Corinthians. Corinthians has not been written yet. Is everybody with me? So if they have the book of 1 Corinthians, you can't say the maturity of the church because he hasn't even... He does talk about that in other books of the Bible, but not in 1 Corinthians, so it's not there. The second thing that you could say is the completeness or the canon of Scripture. But again, you come to the problem, well, how were they supposed to know that? Because he never mentions that in the book of 1 Corinthians. It's not there. And some of the other books of the Bible have not been written. So there's no way, again, for the people of Corinth, when they read that, to understand that. Then there's the third option. Well, it has to, what about the return of Christ? Well, there is a lot of references to that in the book of 1 Corinthians. In fact, I'm going to take you to a verse that you may not be familiar with, that he actually opened the book of 1 Corinthians with, kind of setting the thesis, and now he's writing about it. And you go all the way back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. How many know that's early in the book? Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift, as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. How many know that sounds like face to face? That's completeness, right? So the context here is this. Until Jesus come, we need the gifts. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has been sent to, send his, to take the activity of Jesus through us and to us. But when Jesus shows up, I don't need that anymore because I got the real deal right in front of me. Face to face. But because I'm not face to face, I need his Holy Spirit who helps me to do the work of Jesus until he comes. Everybody see that? It's the only way, the, and I say, you say, man, that was a lot. Well, I'm sorry. It's the only way I knew to show you the definitiveness of this because it, it's very clear. So with that is this. We know that spiritual gifts can be a challenge because then later on, 13 chapters later, he's talking about those challenges. It does get messy. It's, it's, it's very difficult. Now, I'm going to shift gears real quick. We're going to go to, what does the Bible teach us about the pitfalls related, what I say, to the prophetic or the supernatural? What does the Bible talk about? Where are the scriptures that speak to these pitfalls? And I'm going to be wrapping this up soon. Now, you say, what does that mean? Nothing. 
I just throw that in every once in a while to give people hope. <laughs> but if, you, if, you're, if you've been here a while, you know that. If you're new, just, just want to remember, like, he said like 20 minutes ago he was wrapping this thing up. And it just, it just means that I might be halfway. <laughs> Possibly. Okay? So here we go. I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you some things this morning. So number one, read it out loud. The, <laughs> the God told me trap. Now, let me just say this. Do I believe God speaks to people? Yes. Do I believe that sometimes we need to relay this, what those impressions are to other people as, as appropriate? Yes. So this is not a dismantling of that. I do not believe in this at all. It's not that at all. But what I'm saying is, it's just like the gifts can be abused as we see in 1 Corinthians 13, this can be abused. And I want to talk about that the Bible actually shows us how this can happen. But listen to me, Christianity has always had people who abuse God's voice. Okay, There's never been a time where people weren't saying, God said, God told me, and then as things played out, people went, oh, that wasn't God. That was last night's lasagna. But, you know, but so we just have to recognize that that has always been an issue. It's constant. This is why we, like I said, that's why we have the Bible, because it speaks to all these challenges. So we have to be aware of this. So, and here's what I've noticed as a pastor, and, and let me just say this. I've been in ministry over 39 years, and then I grew up as a pastor's kid as well. So I've seen it all. I've, I've experienced a lot of this by watching people and sometimes, you know, even in my own leadership. And I'm, I don't stand here today to tell you I've always done it right and I've always gotten it right. You know, you, some of you may go, wow, it must be awesome to have always known this. Well, some of this I got it from the school of hard knocks. And some of you go, what? Yeah, uh, experience? How many know life really gets clear in the rearview mirror? But man, I'll tell you what, when it's coming at you at the windshield and it's raining and there's bugs and there's traffic and all that, and you're trying to navigate everything, it's hard to sometimes make the right call in what I call sudden moments. But boy, when it's in the rearview mirror, you can go, well, yeah, we should have this and we should have that. It's always easy. So you get 39 years in the rearview mirror of ministry, you know, you can kind of go, well, I'm, I wish I'd have known that 39 years ago. So part of this is, like I say, it comes from my own errors or not recognizing what was happening in front of me and not, and not taking the authority that I think God wanted me to have at that particular moment. So I don't stand here going, boy, I've always done it right. No, I confessed my sins earlier. I've made mistakes. I know that disillusions you. <laughs> but I've made mistakes. So here's what I've noticed. Why do people exercise this tone? And it's really manipulative. And they really believe they're right. In fact, sometimes they are right, but how they go about it is wrong. While they had a desire to make things right or to bring people or situations into conformity with what they perceived to be God's will, they ultimately were driven by a desire to control. They reached the conclusion, they won't say it out loud, but the assumption is this, God's moving too slow, so let me help him out. And zing, zing, zing. They start zinging people, and they start, and it's instead of informing them or trying to help them, they actually move into the arena of trying to control them. And that's not right. You may have a good impression, you may have good intentions, you may have a good thought, you may have a good insight, and it probably needs to be shared, and it probably, but how you do that can be disruptive and become, it, it's not about what you said, it's how you did it. And so it's this God told me. So we must recognize this, I'm going to say this, and I know there's going to be some cautions immediately when I say this, and so I'll back it up with scripture. We must recognize that we can read God's word and yet not hear his voice. God's word without his voice is legalism. So, oh, I thought when I read God's word, that was his voice. Okay. Let me go to the Bible. Let me go to the Bible since you said that's the authority. Here we go. John 5, 37 through 40. This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice, nor seen his form, 
Nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. Look at it. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me. So let me break this down. You study the scriptures diligently, yet you've never heard his voice or seen his form. When we, listen to me, when we read the word, there's a voice that comes with it. Here we got that? There's a voice that talks to me. Now let me just, why is that? Because the Bible says, Hebrews mentions a verse. It says the Bible, or it says the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. So it's living. In Timothy, it says it is God-breathed, useful for uh, rebuking and correcting and teaching and righteousness and equipping. So here's the thing. We're not reading just a book we are experiencing the voice and the breath of God. So when I read that word, there's a voice that comes with it. Because without his voice, it becomes legalism. Everybody got it? So that's why I said it's possible to go, well, the Bible says, right. And the voice of God says, what about that he's relaying to you? It's living. It's active. So it's critical that I understand that as I read, God also wants to talk to me about what I'm reading. Many of you have probably said this at some point in time in your life. You've read the Bible. You said, I've read the Bible so many times. And then that, do you know that verse? It just jumped off the page right at me. It was was the Holy Spirit speaking to you. That's what it was. It was the voice of God. Or you've read something and literally you've heard a voice in your heart, your head that said, that's you and yet you've read that verse so many times and now you read it and there's a voice that says that's you i don't know about you i've read scripture and i've had those moments please don't think i'm terrible when i say this i I had a a, what i was going to read you know for for the day and i hit one of those points and it's like the god just or the holy spirit said that's you I, had to, I didn't finish reading. I just closed my Bible and just started praying, saying, God, what is it about that that makes that me? See, if I'm not careful, I will drown out his voice with more reading. When he, I've learned this. When he says, that's you, don't keep reading. Stop and say, what is it that's there that's about me? He's talking to you. He wants you. To hear his voice, not just read the Bible. Listen to me. When you're reading the Bible, say, please, God, feel feel free to interrupt my scripture reading as you see fit. (laughs) Your voice will take precedence if you want to speak to me as I'm reading about something. All right? Number two, everybody read it out loud. Prophesying. We've all had impressions where we thought we ought to walk up and tell somebody something and then Maybe the Holy Spirit walked us back and go, yeah, you don't want to do that. Maybe sometimes we should, but there's an element in the Bible that I want you to see that sometimes people can say maybe the right thing in the wrong way, and we're going to have to go to the Old Testament on this, but never trust an impression about someone with whom you're angry or jealous. Why? Because those impressions are being driven by your anger and your jealousy. And if you entertain it long enough, you can call it God's voice. No, it's not God's voice. It's your voice. You're just hiding behind him. And then you may go do something and it came from anger and jealousy. It wasn't God. It was you. You just used God and hijacked him to get your agenda on the person. The problem is you were angry and you were jealous of a person. You can't hear God's voice when anger and jealousy is louder than his voice. It will cause a shipwreck every time. Let me take you to the Bible to show you how this happened to a guy. King Saul. He he started out anointed. He started out gifted by God in in the realm of the Spirit. 1 Samuel 10.10. When he saw, and I put the word saw just so you know that's who we're talking about. So that that word's not there, okay? but it's who he's talking about. When he saw and his servant arrived at Gabeah, a procession of prophets met him. 
The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. Notice it says, the Spirit of God came on him powerfully. Now, let's walk the journey of this anointing that God is giving Saul. So now we go to 1 Samuel chapter 11, verses 6 through 8. We're going to pick up a story here. Let me set it up. There's been an invasion, and one of the tribes is about to be conquered, and they've sent out word asking for help, or they have to surrender, and they will be conquered. Word reaches Saul about this invasion. When Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he burned with anger. Verse 8, when Saul mustered them at Bezek, the men of Israel numbered 300,000 and those of Judah 30,000. Now what's key here, I know it says he's angry, but what I want you to recognize is this. God used Saul to solve a national crisis. It was an invasion. A, a part of the, of, the, of the nation was about to be conquered. And Saul was like, we cannot let that happen. And so the anointing, uh, the Holy Spirit came on him, and God used him to solve the problem. So let me just say this. We need to pray for an empowerment of the Holy Spirit on all of our leaders so that they can solve problems in our community and our nation. That was really bad. For all of our leaders, whether you voted for them or not. Okay? People, I get... The banter is unbelievable. I go, listen, I may not have voted for this leader or voted for that leader. I may have voted here. But here's the point. I don't want any of my leaders to fail because when they mess up, my life gets hard. And your life gets hard. So if, sometimes I just pray, please, God, let them see the error of their ways and change. But I never am happy when leaders fail. We suffer. That went over well today. <laughs> I'm never, I'm never, I want you to fail. Of course, that's going to affect my livelihood, but hey, I'll feel good about it. No. All right, so what happens to Saul? We all know we went astray. Where was the pivot? It's actually in 1 Samuel chapter 18. This guy has the Holy Spirit come on him. He's prophesying. Holy Spirit comes on him. He solves a national crisis. So where did he go wrong? It's actually in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 6 through 9. Now, there's other places that we see cracks in his failing. But this is something to show you another dimension that, that hampered his, his ability to be the leader that God wanted. So they have defeated Goliath, the Philistine, David. And then with that, they, the Israelites chased the rest of the, of the Philistines out, and they were victorious. So now they're up entering the city. We're going to jump down about halfway in this verse. It says, as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought. But me with only thousands, what more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. This is why he was not ever able to deal with David effectively and honestly the rest of his life. Saul thought he really was doing the Lord's work, trying to kill David. Saul really believed he was right. But what he doesn't realize was this, that wasn't God. That was his anger and his jealousy towards David. And so it made it very difficult for Saul to understand what God wanted and what God did not want because he was driven by anger and jealousy towards David. And a prophetic gift got distorted and people got hurt. It ultimately ended up destroying Saul. The very thing that he wanted to do to David ended up happening to Saul. Saul was the one who was the recipient of his own, what he thought was prophecy, <laughs> ended up speaking his own doom. So the prophesying out of jealousy and anger, sometimes you just need to go, there can't be anything here because my jealousy and my anger is too loud. 
So whatever voice is trying to disguise itself as God in this context, God, I just rebuke that. Until I resolve this jealousy and this anger, I can't hear from you regarding that person or that situation. I'm too angry and I'm too jealous. I need to focus on what's going on in here rather than what's going on over there. Everybody amen? amen. Number three, and I really do mean this. This is the last one, okay, really. That's the honest truth. Okay, here we go. Read it out loud. The desire... You think, well, that's a weird point. I know it. Didn't know any way to say it. Christianity has always had people who saw Christianity as their ticket to get a public platform to make themselves famous. It's one thing for God to give it to you. It's another thing to make that a part of your plan. And you're going to figure out how to get yourself there rather than God taking you there. And we've seen this played out in American culture over and over. Even people who started out well, but somehow in there they, they, they lost their way. Why? Because it was not about following God. It was about chasing a forum, a platform to become more known, more famous, more. And I'm just here to say, you can let me tell you this. And, and you're welcome to even use this on me, what I'm about to read here. You can use this on me, on all of us. You can tell a story where people think you are amazing, or you can tell a story where they think God is amazing. There's two ways to tell a story. When you're done, are they going, wow, look at you? Or are they saying, wow, look what God did? See what I'm talking about? It's the, the story's true. The story was right. It's how the story got told. And I say that about prophecy. Prophecy is no different. There's one way to engage in prophecy that God gets the credit. There's another way that you can do this in which you want people to think, wow, look at God using you. So, let's move on. I'll give you a couple examples scripturally and we'll wrap this up. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, this is John. He's with an angel. And he says, this, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't do that. Notice the exclamation point. Don't do that. I am a, follow, a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Notice he's yelling it. See the exclamation point? This is not like an angel being, I don't know about you. An angel yelling at me would, you know, I was like, dude, I'm here. You know, like, okay, I hit a nerve here. But you see, you've got to remember one-third of the angels turned on God because they wanted to be awesome. They wanted to share the platform. Since God wasn't going to give them the fame that they wanted, they decided that they would position themselves for it. So you can understand why this angel is angry. We've already had one split in heaven. Ain't happening again. Don't do that. Now, give, man, this is, this is a powerful statement. For it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. Isn't that, you know how you know what a real prophecy is? Who's getting the credit? Person or Jesus? Scripture says the spirit of prophecy bears testimony to Jesus. Hmm. Interesting. Like I said, it's always been an arena that can get messy. And sometimes we need to be aware of these things that we can go, yeah, I think the gift was good, but I think how the gift got used might not have been the best. Let's look at another example. This is John the Baptist. John the Baptist definitely had a platform but it's a, of ministry, but it's interesting how he saw it. There's a verse here that everybody is familiar with, but we sometimes miss how he leads into this verse. So we're going to back it up. This is what he was, at, he was being asked about Jesus. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. So what John the Baptist is saying this, if you're not the bridegroom, don't act like the bridegroom when he's there because it's not your wedding. Even the bride knows the bridegroom is calling the shots and the friend knows the bridegroom calls the shots. Don't try to be the bridegroom, especially when he's there. You'll, make a, you'll wreck the wedding, and you may not like how it goes. Look at what he said. That joy is mine and is now complete. I mu he must become greater and I must become less. Wow. 
John the Baptist recognized this. The bridegroom's here. I've told you about this wedding. I'm in the wedding. But now he's here. So I need to let the bridegroom do the talking and I need to shut up. That's powerful. Because here's the part that you don't may, maybe have forgotten. John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus. I think, what in the world did Jesus must have done for him to make his cousin believe and know that he was a son? I got a lot of cousins. Trust me, none of them are the son of God. <laughs> and I got cousins who would go, I don't care if he's a pastor, he's not the son of God either. I was like, you're right, you're right. Yeah. I mean, you're like, wow. And John the Baptist now realizes, here's the bridegroom. I no longer need to speak for the bridegroom because he's here. So now I need to talk less and you need to listen to him because he's here. See, before I was speaking on his behalf because he wasn't here, but now he's here. Wow, that's humility. That's knowing your role. That's knowing your title. That's knowing your position in Christ, that we're servants. And then you come to Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Jesus said this, you are the light of the world. A town built on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Everybody read that last sentence with me. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. And Oh, so when you do something good, who's supposed to get the credit? Okay, half of you knew it and the other half didn't know it. So we're going to rehearse it one more time. When you do something good, who's supposed to get the credit? God. My job is to have, my job is to make him famous. So it tells us here we need to do things in a way so that people understand that God gets the credit. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very transparent as I wrap up the service. I'll give you an example. Because we have to learn how, I'm going to say, how to protect our egos. We all like to be complimented. Okay. Everybody likes to have somebody say thank you. I appreciate you doing that. I don't want to create, I don't want you to hear this and then go, well, we shouldn't compliment people. It might go to their head. And then we'll have an anti-complimentary content. We like, we like people to thank us for what we do. It, it feels good. But what I want to talk about is the voice that goes on inside of you when you hear those compliments. How do you talk to yourself about what you hear so that your ego doesn't get the best of you? And I'm going to take you into a little bit of privacy into my own life. I'm, I'm very blessed to be in this church. And, and the, the people of this church are very complimentary. Every week, somebody will either verbally or through some electronic means give me a, uh, you know, an affirmation on that, that really spoke to my life or this or that. And it's very affirming. Now, I'm going to take you into a little bit of a privacy of my life. Because I recognize that over a course of time, if you're not careful, you'll start preaching to get those accoloids. And then you can't talk about the tough stuff. So you say, well, so how do you handle it? This is the conversation I have with myself. Thank you, God, for letting me be a part of your activity into that person's life. Because I realize you could have used somebody else. But you let me be a part of it. And I'm humbled. Thank you. Can we do it again next week, Jesus? <laughs> I like facilitating your activity into other people's lives. And I know, listen, I know you got options, but you're letting me in. Thanks. That's how you keep your, and I, I'm just saying, that's one, it's the self-talk that can get you in trouble. You go, wow, I didn't know people felt that way about what I had to say. That's pretty awesome. I mean, if you're not careful, you will take, your conversation will be your destruction two years from now. It didn't happen in a week. It didn't happen in a month. It happened over a period of years. And before you know it, you're talking to yourself in a way. It's not God's voice, but you've gotten so familiar to your voice, you think it's God. And it's your ego that's talking to you. And you get yourself in trouble. You tell yourself, thank you. Thank you for using me. Thank you for letting me be a part 
of a new dimension in that person. Thank you. And it's just the way, let me just say, when you pray for somebody, it's exciting for somebody to come back and go, even to you, and go, man, when you prayed, God answered prayer. And as a person, you want to go, well, hallelujah. Maybe I've got a healing ministry. Maybe no, you, Listen, be careful. Just say, God, thank you for honoring my prayer when I prayed over that person. Wow. Because I know it was you that facilitated the answer. L thank you for letting me be a part of that answer in that person's life. Always keep him the center of your worship and giving glory and honor. You're a servant. It's a great place to be. Everybody said amen. amen. Come on, let's stand as we wrap up the service this morning. Can you do that? All over this place, can you just lift your hand and just praise him for being a God who includes you in his activity? Come on, man. Everybody in this room has said a prayer on behalf of somebody else, and God answered. Can you, can you at least say, God, I want to thank you for letting me be a part of your activity in that person's life because I realize I was not your only option, but you let me be a part of it. Come on, man. Thank him for that today.